Good afternoon, good evening. You're all welcome to our last panel of the day. We've worked a lot, but I'm sure that it's going to be worthwhile. We have a luxury panel right now. I'd like to introduce you and start by Moots Botibooks. She's director of Practical Tools on the Knowledge for Infrastructure. She is with us remotely. Good afternoon, Mood. I would also like to greet the Finance Secretary for the State of Sao Paulo, Mr. Enrique Meirelles. He was also President of the Central Bank, Secretary of Finance. Very few people can better give an idea of how our infrastructure development is like. I would also like to greet my colleague, Kyla, oh, Carla, I'm sorry, Ibertoko. She is partner of Mawa Capital. She led the PPP process for the state of Sao Paulo in the past. And also, Jessica Springston, with, which is with us remotely. She's a partner of Clifford Chance Law Office. I think that of all of the panels we've had throughout the day with a lot of messages, best practices, but I wanted to raise the bar of our discussion to a more strategic level. I captured two important messages here, and I wanted to add a third one before we start with this discussion here today. First of all, I think that the first message I captured here was that Latin America, of course, has to invest more. The region will have to invest or increase it in 3.5% per year for the next 10 years so that we can reach the sustainable development goals. And if we want to do this in a carbon neutral or zero carbon environment, this investment will be much higher. We already knew this, but the region has to invest better with more focus, more quality, where climate change, social demands require better infrastructure. The second aspect is that the pandemic has found Latin America in a very difficult tax situation. And that was even before the pandemic. And of course, the reaction of the different governments to COVID-19 has led to a competition of resources that were dedicated to infrastructure. So we left the pandemic in a much worse tax situation than we were before the pandemic, and that will have a cost in terms of the public ability to invest in infrastructure. A final aspect I'd like to add here before we start this discussion is that we have forgotten that before the pandemic, and it feels like it was in a different lifetime, the protests as we've had here in Brazil and in Chile in 2019, all of that started because of minor increases in transportation fees. In other words, today we have populations that demand better infrastructure services with better quality, and they can get together to demand this. So how are we going to deal with the need to invest more, with the tax limitations for investments, and the need to provide better infrastructure services? This is where PPPs offer a response. But for that to take place, we must discuss how we're going to mobilize capital, how we're going to make this happen from a financial point of view. And this is where our panelists will be able to help us. 
Let's start with Maud. She's a director of the Global Infrastructure Hub, and she has a global view of the challenges that are taking place in the infrastructure scenario. So she can help us with some context for this conversation. So Maud, I'd like to start by making a statement. In the post-COVID world, might be the main driving force for recovery. So my question to you, it's actually two questions. First, do you agree with that statement? And two, what are the challenges to mobilize resources for that to happen? And actually, I feel like asking a th third question. Who else is competing for those resources, regionally speaking? Over to you, Maud. Well, thank you for inviting me and for the organization of the PPP America. It's been a pleasure to be here today. And I would to, to special thanks to IDB as well. We have a long cooperation with IDB over the past few years. So, um, yes, investment in infrastructure is a great engine for recovery, and it's more effective than any other type of public spending in the medium term. The Global Infrastructure Hub has been tasked by the G20 Action Plan in response to COVID to conduct an analysis on this question, and it shows that public investment as an average fiscal multiplier of about 1.5 within two to five years compared to all other forms of public spending. The IMF Fiscal Monitor Report 2020 on public investment for the recovery shows that public investment has strong effect on employment and has the potential to boost growth and increase employment, especially for local jobs in the construction sector. You can consult the infrastructure stimulus package announced in all the 20 economies through InfraTracker and you have, of course, Brazil, which is, um, we have all the data on, on Brazil for the infrastructure stimulus package. But at the same time, the level of debt has increased to tackle the pandemic effect on average between 12 and 20%, which puts a lot of public pressure on the budget and especially for investment for infrastructure. The GIHUB Monitor released last week shows that globally for the past seven years, private investment in infrastructure has remained stable in developed economies, but has declined by 28% in 2020 um, for low and middle income countries. So the equation is quite simple. Need for infrastructure is still very high but the fiscal space is limited given the level of debt. So the need for the private sector and private investment is crucial. So what are the challenges now? I would like to highlight uh, some of the global challenges at a macro level first. The, the first challenge is the unprecedented level and volume of demand for infrastructure. And I'm back to all the stimulus packages announced around the globe. So a lot of volume in the market in the coming. And of course, Brazil um, had very, very high volume of infrastructure through these PPP and privatization programs for many years now and still ongoing. There is the other major trend that can be observed in the market is the shortage of skills and the problem of market capacity. I can give you an example here in Australia. Um, the report published um, very recently by Infrastructure Australia shows that there will be in 2023 52 billion of infrastructure spent in 2023 in Australia. And in front of that, there is one out of three positions that are unfilled, and the demand for skills is 48% higher than the supply. So big market capacity, big market capacity problem. Uh, material and equipment are under pressure 
with border closure. And um, that's, that's a trend in the global market for steel, for other material and equipment for major infrastructure projects. And another trend is the insolvency and also some tension um, around the construction sector and construction company. And you know now that it's a global sector with global player and the need for more sustainable industry and sustainable construction sector. And of course, the, the other major trends that you highlight in your introduction is the, the climate change and transition outcome and focus toward a low carbon economy and a shift a transition to more renewable um, energy and renewable infrastructure projects. Um, so just now at a project level, um, just to highlight some of the main challenges to mobilize uh, private investment and private finance in infrastructure, especially through PPP contract, I can list some of them, but I'm sure you're aware of those, is the lack of well-prepared and well-structured project, um, and, and the lack of programs at a larger scale, um, the lack of a strong enabling environment, PPP policy, procurement rules. Of course, uh, it's, not, um, a it's a global trend again, and, and a lot of countries are much more advanced than other, and that's the case also for South America with a very, some, some country very advanced and, and some other um, more uh, lacking in, in regulation, policy, and enabling environment. Um, I would say the capability and the capacity, um, and especially in the public sector side, it, it is one of the major challenges today. Um, also, some, in some countries, uh, local capital markets are, are not um, developed uh, as, as, as much as in all countries in, in South America, and the foreign currency risk uh, covering uh, for foreign investor in some of those markets uh, can still be a challenge. Um, and also the lack, I would say, the lack of dialogue um, between the public and the private sector. For example, the uh, market sounding, market consultation uh, that are actually uh, pra uh, practice um, in, in, in Brazil. And I know that uh, uh, the PPP unit, the Sao Paulo PPP unit uh, is, is quite um, uh, I've, I've been used uh, market sounding and market consultation and dialogue with the private sector to better shape and structure those those infrastructure projects. But in a lot of jurisdiction, um, there is a lot of project going to the market without a proper dia dialogue with, with the private sector. So that's just some of the challenges I want to highlight. And again, it's 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 uh, at a macro level. But thank you, thank you for for your question. Thank you, Maud. You were very accurate in identifying these challenges, the need to develop, develop good projects, the lack of capacity and capability in some sectors, in some countries, and the development of their local capital markets. That said, I'll turn it over to the Secretary so that we can talk a little bit. Secretary. So we have these global challenges, but there are also global opportunities. We have considerable liquidity around the world, global competition for investments, and for these resources. Could you tell us how Sao Paulo is dealing with that competition and how it sees the importance of PPPs and the mobilization of private resources for the investment in infrastructure? Yes, of course. Well. It's a pleasure to be here. Congratulations on the event. Congratulations on the organization of the event. And this is an actual and objective situation that has been very well described. In Brazil, in most emerging and less developed countries, but in general, the fact is that the demand for infrastructure is well above the ability to invest by the public sector. Mm -hmm. There is no way for the public sector to make the required investments in different sectors and especially in infrastructure. The state of Sao Paulo has been reacting to that. It's been very 
actively reacting to that. The first thing we offer in this global competition is legal stability. The state of Sao Paulo has the opportunity, thanks to the independence we have in Brazil, the state independence from the federal government, we can provide legal certainty that provides security to investors. For instance, we have 41 ongoing projects in Brazil, in the state of Sao Paulo. They've been here for years, such as 10,000 kilometers of motorways that are under concession. And this is all private investment. And they're doing very well. So that legal certainty is an excellent foundation. It's a great starting point for a dialogue. And that's very important. So we do see that competition. But what you said is true. There is a lot of liquidity in the world. Resource management at central banks, if despite the tapering, and speaking of which, the fact is that resources are available. We can see that very concretely here in Sao Paulo. For instance, at the beginning of last year, we conducted a bidding process for a motorway of 1,300 kilometers that goes across the center of Sao Paulo state, 1,300 kilometers. The investment was supposed to be just over $3 billion, and there was a great deal of competition for that. So investors were actively competing for that. So there was a winner, a consortium of two global funds, a sovereign fund and a private equity fund both international funds. And it was quite a fierce competition. There was a great deal of interest. And high requirements, the first zero carbon motorway in the country, it was the largest motorway concession in Brazil. And the contract was signed during the pandemic. It was signed in June 2020. So the pandemic was already happening. And these consortia are long term. They bet on the long term. They bet on long term demand and on the legal certainty offered by the state government. So there was a great deal of interest. Now we're working on other projects. There's an intercity train. a passenger train, mainly, between Sao Paulo, Jundiaí, and Campinas for roughly 640,000 passengers a day. So there is a demand. So we talked about legal certainty. I've just talked about demand. There is demand. It's well established. It's an existing demand. It's a fact. We haven't gone through that bidding process yet, and it should take place soon. But groups in different parts of the world have already shown an interest in that, actual interest in investing in this train. It's an urban and suburban train. Part of it is urban inside Sao Paulo State and suburban and then interurban. So we have demand, as you said, the crucial thing is having well-designed, well-structured projects, technically good projects, so that they can make sense, not only in terms of profit, but also in terms of long-term structure. So that's another point. And We're also 
now privatizing, granting concessions, and revamping old concessions that had problems for the underground in Sao Paulo. So there are major long-term projects that are being implemented, and they are successful. They are ongoing in Sao Paulo right now. So again, the key elements are good projects, guaranteed demand, an actual real demand, and the f liquidity around the world. Of course, there is competition for resources for the reasons we've heard. But on the other hand, there is liquidity. There are plenty of funds with plenty of liquidity that are looking for attractive projects, feasible projects that provide safety and security. So that's the big picture. And that's the way forward. And that applies to other areas as well. We're privatizing parks in Sao Paulo, for instance, urban parks, the Agua Branca Park, the Villa Lobos Park, zoos, smaller projects, obviously, financially speaking, but even the Iba Iberapuera Gymnasium, now people are discussing whether it should be listed or not, but that is also undergoing privatization. Power companies. Why? Because there's a demand for it. The Metropolitan Water and Power Company is undergoing privatization. We're also working on a project to find the best way for private capital inflows into Sabespi, whether it be through fundraising or through the pub public sector or through privatization. We hired the IFC, the World Bank Agency, to format that project. So we're talking about international financial institutions and how they can help us. In this case, by officially and formally formatting a project and considering the different options for the best capital structure for the company. Now, the legal format comes before that, and that is key. The first project we did with Sabesp was to work with uh, other states and the federal government to come up with a new regulatory framework. We did it during the President Michel Temer's administration. We got another provisional measure. It then became the law. And that gave us a solid regulatory framework in Rio and other regions. For instance, privatizations are allowed, whether it be by sector, by region, or by privatizing the company as a whole. So that's the backdrop. It's feasible, and it's the only way out. That's the point. So if you want to be successful, you need those points. Legal certainty comes first. The, a good technical structure for the project, demand and predictability. Those are the points. Okay. In all areas. Uh, I'm talking about the privatization of prisons, schools, hospitals, everything. Fantastic, Secretary. Thank you for that very broad overview of the Sao Paulo State PPP program and concession program. Undoubtedly, a very important program. And that's a great segue for me to turn it over to Carla. Carla played a key role in that in the past. Carla, as I said, you led the public-private partnership program here in Sao Paulo. 
during probably what was the toughest time for the infrastructure sector in Brazil. What lessons did you learn from your time then that you are using as an investor now at Mauá? What did you learn that you can use as an investor now? Thank you, Alexandre, for your question. And thank you for the invitation. It's really nice to be here with you. We've gone through very difficult times. Today, we're facing difficult times again, but for other reasons. I think that the lessons learned back then can eventually help us to go through the moment we're facing now. This has been extensively discussed, so I'm going to discuss some more specific topics. Perhaps we could help the investors that are looking for this kind of help in terms of mobilization of private resources. At the time, we had a lot of infrastructure challenges with the construction service here in Brazil. We also have the car wash operation and all of its effects. But we can perhaps use this moment to make changes that have been important with the support of the IBD by means of facility. But it helped us change the way we choose our partners for infrastructure projects. In the past, in a bidding process, you would choose those who had experience working with infrastructure, uh, infrastructure assets. But what really made an infrastructure project feasible was the funding aspect more than the technical qualities. So if you were able to align everything and if you had a good player, that player would be interested and then we would have the best technical capacity to fund the project. So what we did was we changed the very detailed technical requirements. For example, for a, a freeway or a road, we would demand an X number of vehicles and an X number of freeways. But now we need to have people who can take on the project. Construction companies were not happy with all of the changes and we changed the way we lead with the consortia and the competition and the bidding process. And we, but for us to do this, only these changes were not enough. We had to standardize information. For those who are familiar with the sector, we know how it works. I've been a regulator, so uh, we're always trying to go after the specific aspects. We enabled the technical requirements to be led by a third party. With that, we can take into account those who had the technical ability but did not have other requirements. Now, here and here in Brazil, I participated with your support. And uh, when we told people that here in Brazil, for you to have a bidding process for a road construction of 60 days, most of them would give up right away. They there was no f foreign player that would come to Brazil under those circumstances. Um, sometimes um, we didn't have anything in English or the tender process was not clearly explained in English and outside Brazil. PPPs were not very common back then. We wanted to have uniform information to help those who were beginning with this type of process. And so, first of all, we have changed the format for the requirements of uh, technical background. That enabled us to have access to information. But then, at the end of the day, there were some other important factors, and we've already discussed them. For example, 
the risk of the exchange rate. When we talk about liquidity, you know, we want to have people coming from overseas to participate in bidding processes in Latin America. We have a federal bank. But what we did was we used a different system so that we can protect within certain limitations we so that we could deal with the issue of the exchange rate risk. For example, if I have $400 million, we would be able to cover that based on all of our agreements. With PPP, you have to take into account other structures. When I worked for BNDS, we always thought that at a federal level we had to develop models that would help us with projects that cannot properly deal with exchange rate issues. And now, today, when I'm working with investors, so this is something that we mention all the time. We want to have a better idea of a very detailed risk, risk matrix. For example, demand risk. Okay, this is easy for uh, state-owned companies, and Brazil has gone through a lot. Perhaps for a different segment, you will have to work with other aspects. So the demand risk, construction risk, is there anything to be shared? Is the project interesting? Also, hiring peer reviews for international um, investors and uh, they had to be issued by a third party. Also, the legal framework is very important. The appetite to invest in infrastructure is huge, but you have to take into account the amount of capital that's going to be used. And these are my considerations. Thank you. Excellent, Carla. Thank you very much. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about sustainability. Jessica, who is a very experienced lawyer, and she's here with us. So she's a very experienced lawyer in the region. She's um, organized different transactions and can give us an idea of the project finance in the region. And so, Jessica, I ask you now, this new demand of investors, consumers, for more sustainable projects from an environmental and social point of view. Is this an obstacle for these projects, for these transactions? Or do you see this as an opportunity that is opening to us? So how do you see this according to your practical experience? My presence. Which was only a few weeks ago, uh, we can see that climate change issues have become and will remain a global focus. Um, we think investors and corporate boardrooms have obligations to shareholders and their own workforce to continue to find opportunities to find projects that are environmental, environmentally and sustainably sound. One of the things that we've noticed, or the most notable change we are seeing right now, as I'm sure many of you are, is the focus on energy transitions and the way to produce clean energy. Um, energy transition is going to require a massive and increased rate of investment in renewable energy, increased electrification of the industries, transportation and heating, and as well as the development of clean hydrogen um, and also carbon, cap carbon capture and storage um, at a scalable you know, at scale to be able to capture emissions that just can't be prevented. Investing in this type of low carbon economy is, is absolutely the path forward for many of our clients, not just because of the investment opportunities it presents, but also because it's the right thing to do and increasingly in a requirement of their regulators and investors and lenders. A growing number of our clients, such as lenders and sponsors, uh, financial institutions, energy and oil and gas companies, DFIs and um, export credit agencies and many others have either over the past year or so 
announced their commitments to achieving net zero emissions by 2030 or 2050 in order to align with the climate goals of the Paris Agreement and most recently the agreements they reached in COP26, or they've instituted a, a major shift in their business strategy to invest in the subsector of energy uh, transition. Some of these commitments have actually included policies which seek to ban or restrict financing or investing in the most carbon intensive energy projects. I think that's something to highlight because we really hadn't seen that before. Um, and, you know, investing or restricting the type of finance um, will include having enhanced due diligence around how and when to participate and advise on these transactions. And then additionally, you know, increasing focus and scrutiny on ESG, environmental and social corporate government factors, um, is going to be a key theme across uh, many of our clients. Our firm has focused on or decided to focus on seven pillars of the energy transition and where we are seeing future growth um, with significant potential with current and new, uh, with existing and new clients. Um, it's expanded renewables, so, you know, the whole spectrum of renewable technologies from rooftop solars to the major offshore wind projects in the world, um, expanded ca carbon capture, uh, that's you know critical to being able to get to these net zero goals. Clean hydrogen is, is you know, close to my heart. I'm on the uh, task force of our firm. Um, you know, it has the potential to change the way that we generate and store and transport and consume energy. So that's definitely one of our pillars energy storage and um, transmission and interconnection key to being able to continue to um, supply energy um, both at the generation side and the demand side. Carbon trading and investment, uh, it's, you know, we all know it's a market-based system and it's aimed at reducing the greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming. Um, infratech, you know, this is, you know, it was a trend pre-COVID-19, but it is increasingly seen as critical element to delivering sustainable infrastructure. And then finally, the seventh pillar is new nuclear. Um, this includes small modular reactors that are quicker and simpler to build than traditional uh, larger nuclear power plants. Uh, when we think about these seven pillars and you know, you know, why are we doing this, we think about how they apply in Latin America as a region. Um, in, you know, we, for example, we're seeing increasing importance, as I mentioned, in renewable energy and linking those types of projects to recovery plans to green projects, um, making it more of an attractive investment opportunity from an ESG perspective. Um, Latin American countries pledged to meet a 70% renewable energy use by target 2030. We're, we're seeing you know, solar projects, off -where wind, offshore wind projects are going to increase. You know, countries are making it a priority to establish um, national hydrogen plans which has been great. Um, Chile is, is, is on top of that and probably among the leaders. Um, and, at, you know, in Colombia at COP26, President Duque announced um, their new long-term strategy. So we're hopeful that everyone is committed to these carbon zero goals and given the pressure to find new opportunities, many of our clients are starting pilot projects to explore new technologies. And it is the first time that at least we feel as a firm that it isn't just talk, it's actually concrete action. And, you know, there's a, a giant green hydrogen project in Spain that's going to happen um, that is, is, is probably, you know, the most emblematic of why this is no longer just a sort of, you know, an idea. Um, so from a global perspective and having the benefit of working at our firm and being part of a worldwide team of lawyers um, who we constantly share knowledge and information across our network, uh, we see Europe as the as a nexus of where many of these projects using these new technologies, you know, they're they are ahead of, of Latin America, but they're a great partner. And all the lessons that we're learning there, we will absolutely apply to projects in Latin America. So this is a benefit to Latin America because you know they can take them and apply them to their jurisdictions and, and try to implement new technologies in these types of projects. Obrigado, Je. Me escuto? Sim. Thank you. Obrigado, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica, this for this having given us this, this panorama and actually the opportunities that are open to us based on the sustainability. And you put all of these ideas in a simple manner. But as a secretary, I wanted to explore some of the challenges, despite all of the new opportunities 
there are structural challenges that remain. Long-term funding in Brazil has always been a challenge, especially in the local currency. Carla also talked about this somehow. Maud did so as well. And now, with the decrease of the participation of BNDS in the economy, the capital market had to come in. And this was the idea behind it anyway. So it had to come in to try to supply, for, to make up for this, actually. So my question is, how do you see this context today? Has the capital market been able to supply for this? And is there an opportunity for multilateral institutions such as the IDB or others to participate in this market? I would also like to remind that the fact that the BNDS has decreased its activities coincided with changes in the banking system where some commercial banks are no longer working with the long-term funding of infrastructure projects. Well, I see this as something which is right, and I actually participated directly in this process. The idea was that we had a prior structure where the BNDS interest fee depended on the national monetary system without very specific criteria. It was all political. And with that, what ended up happening was that BNDS rates were much lower than those in the market. Uh, the BNDS was loaning at much lower rates, sometimes 40% lower than the market. So, well, with that, we removed the private sector from the market. But there was another aspect with that. The mean cost of credit, which was defined according to equilibrium models, but when or because BNDS worked with lower rates, that would make the private sector rates to be higher. The private sector rates were feasible for investments in the long term. But when we proposed the TJLP, which was long-term interest rates, we had a convergence of BNDS rates with the market rates. And that led to a decrease of the interest rates in the market, in the long-term market. OK, of, we also have tax issues and the monetary policies and so on and so forth. But there was some convergence, and that was the idea behind it. And then we have the issue of debentures. But the idea was for BNDS to participate in the market, but not in a distorted manner that would create a whole process where only BNDS can fund and fund based on its own policies, despite all of the good intentions behind it. But this is a whole other discussion. There are different opinions, political views. I know because I participated directly in all of these meetings and oftentimes with the president of the monetary board that determined those rates. So the more we can take it to the market for technical decisions with investors, the better it will be. And this is what we're doing. But in the long term, this lead to, leads to a decrease of our mean rates. And that leads to some balance in the economy. 
But of course, in the moment we're going through now with high inflation rates, two-digit inflation rates, but this is not the objective of our discussion here. Of course, I just mention it here, but right now we have tax uncertainties and high long-term interest rates. This is not a good moment for this model to be fully implemented. But this is the situation we have right now, and we expect that in the future when the uh, economy stabilizes and when this turbulent period is behind us, and that we return to our normality, we will define a cap for expenses, interest rates will go down, but now uh, the interest rates are going up again. We have to persevere with this idea that BNDS will participate in the funding and so on and so forth, but it can also participate in the structuring process, which is also very important. And also, it will help, institutionally speaking, with uh, rates that are closer to those of the market so that we can have more consistent practices. So I think that's the process. Otherwise, the process would be completely distorted, and that was unfeasible. So it was a government subsidy through the BNDS, and that was unsustainable. Fantastic. Thank you, Secretary. Can we go back to MOD? Our colleague from the Global Infrastructure Hub. While the Secretary was talking about efficient resource management by the private sector, it made me think of this. MOD, based on your interpretation at the Global Infrastructure Hub, do you think that the PPP mechanism is moving towards becoming more than an efficient bidding mechanism, but also an efficient assignment instrument for private resources to infrastructure? Thank you for your question. Um, as you know, the, the, the PPP model um, has been facing a number of challenges in some jurisdiction over the past few years and for a number of reasons. And to name some of those reasons, I can say the lack of flexibility, sometimes the lack of value for money for government, the unsustainable for PPC contractor because it's a fixed price lump sum contract, and the unbalanced uh, risk allocation. So many of those challenges uh, identified for PPP are actually the same uh, for many contractual models, except that for PPP, it might be exasper exasperated because, um, especially for large infrastructure projects, um, given the specific nature of a fixed price contract associated with um, project finance approach, right? So, but now I want to highlight here some of the key positive features of the PPP model and also uh, probably some of the, of the evolution we have been seeing in some jurisdictions. So on the, one of the main positive features, again, of this contract is really the whole life cycle approach. Uh, and, and that's one of the contracts that can integrate in this contract um, outcomes um, and out, outcomes, long-term outcomes, uh, to better deliver sustainable um, and resilient infrastructure with clear objectives fixed by the contracting authority in the procurement process to achieve those outcomes and to measure um, and the, the contract against those those outcomes. Um, some jurisdictions are starting to rethink the PPP model, and I would like just to highlight here some of the way to improve infrastructure delivery and what are some of the lessons that can be learned. Um, so what we see in some jurisdictions 
uh, is first of all to improve the decision making process before arriving to the contract itself, but of course improve the decision making process and focus on the suitability and appropriateness of contract um, uh, in regards with the specific characteristic of a project. Um, we can see also a lot of increase of the collaborative mindset and a better focus on outcomes. So I can give you an example about a couple of examples about how to rethink um, the risk allocation approach. Uh, it's not anymore the old concept of you know the risk allocation and we push the risk on the private sector because when you push the risk, uh, the risk does not disappear. So it's really more now to identify, assess, and mitigate at the very early stage um, during the decision-making process and before procurement to, to talk about those risks, to mitigate the risk and to allocate sufficient risk contingencies and allowance of risk contingencies when there is the public funding decision at early stage that are made for those big infrastructure projects because we know that the cost estimation of major infrastructure projects is, is, is sometimes very hard to assess and is coming much later when the design maturity is sufficient. So the need to have those risk contingency and um, allowance of budget contingency associated to um, large infrastructure projects and especially to, to PPP on the public sector side. The other thing is to de-risk project uh, by uh, a better planning and preparation, and that's not new. But uh, when the level of uncertainty is too high uh, to actually uh, go for a firm price contract and a fixed price contract, maybe PVP is not a good contract, or maybe there should be a first phase, a first sequence uh, to uh, de risk the project through um, early contractual involvement model, early works, um, or progressive design build, or all types of, of pre-contract that can actually uh, prepare for the signing of the PPP to be a successful contract. Recently in the Melbourne North East Link, which is an 11 billion project that has been signed very recently in Australia, the contract, it's a PPP contract, but the contract was amended to include a incentivized target cost risk and reward regime within the PPP and within the procurement process. And that's an interesting mechanism. Um, so the, the, again, the suitability is the key word, suitability of PPP, where the private sector innovation engineering can be best expressed. Um, so it's more the question of appropriate rather than alternate uh, models. Um, better take into consideration also uh, the packaging strategy and the procurement strategy. And more than the contract itself, is the procurement strategy and the procurement process is the good one, is going to be a very big factor to actually have the good contract. And I think in Brazil, you just adopted a new law on the competitive dialogue for, for PPP contract. And that's quite an interesting also long sequences type of procurement process to actually when you go to the signing, all the elements of the contract are really well known to be able to go in a fixed price contract. Um, we see a lot of emerging of mixed model. That's another trend in the market. So what are those mix or hybrid model? It's model where you actually have um, a bit of public and private financing together. The traffic risk is mitigated. The operational risk is shared. And you can see that um, the public uh, contracting authorities are stepping up to provide more subsidies and, and more um, also um, revenue risk sharing mechanism. And what I want to say here is that the traditional distinction between sometimes concession model, PPP, or other type of model where, for example, the traffic risk is the main element of the characteristic of a specific contractual model, we see an evolution towards more hybrid uh, model and also the need for an agnostic approach of contractual model. That's very important. There is no one good model and one bad model. There is well-prepared projects and projects that are not well-prepared and the best contracts sometimes ask 
this flexibility and innovation and hybrid model where you can actually mix and match um, private and public funding without limitation due to a specific uh, contract characteristic. So um, we see also in the market, of course, a lot of innovation in the close of the contract, into the close of the contract, innovative close, risk sharing mechanism. And I know that Brazil is at the forefront of those contracts. I can just say that in the line eight and nine of the, the metro project in, in Sao Paulo, but also the PIVA project and other uh, recent transaction, there is a lot of uh, innovative clothes that have been uh, used um, uh, and that are very interesting to actually uh, share and to have the step up of uh, government to actually, and especially in COVID time when you have a lot of tension on the traffic risk. Um, so there were some, some, some very good innovation in, in the contract of clothes. Um, and yeah, I, I, I could talk uh, much longer about those innovation, but I think, uh, again, that's for me, it's not so much the contract itself, the problem that really uh, to have this flexibility, innovation uh, that, that, that is allowed and also to have this innovation in the procurement processes to allow, as Jessica said a bit before, all the infra technology, infra tech innovation, some of the procurement process today don't allow really the step up on, on innovation. So sometimes there is also a question around those procurement processes. Thank you. Thank you, Maud. Now, we'll turn it over to Jessica. We only have a few minutes left, but I do have a couple of questions I'd like to ask. One is for Jessica. As I said, she is a market practitioner, and she's seen the impact of the pandemic on the PPP market firsthand. Jessica, what were the lessons you've learned from this experience that will help you, that can help structure more resilient projects to this kind of shock? Over to you, Jessica. So yes, the, you know, obviously the pandemic affected the global markets and, and impacted projects and increased, you know, different types of financings and restructuring. Um, but one of the lessons learned, I think, that we are, you know, seeing and observing and trying to take in is that, you know, sometimes we're just writing the playbook live. Um, it, we just need to be ready to react flexibly, flexibly and creatively to solve problems. I think that's really been the message. Um, you know, one reaction, sort of the specific reaction in the infrastructure financing sector to COVID is to simply make sure pandemics are listed in the definition of force majeure. That's sort of, you know, intellectually that everyone's like, yes, let's do that. And there's nothing wrong with making that change, but it's completely missing the point because the next crisis we face won't be the same as COVID and we need to be ready to react uh, to new circumstances. Generally speaking, I think in the last couple of years, um, we didn't see a lot of projects that were in the pipeline or already being constructed or, or built being canceled. Some of our projects were delayed because governments were shut down and, you know, just practical things like employees not being able to access their office and or, you know, only working from home and not have access to their computers. And, you know, generally speaking, at Latin American governments, didn't have the time and resources to put a working policy in place. I mean, we, we sort of had one as a firm, but even still, it was a it was a learning curve. Um, so it was a matter of just not. It wasn't just the employees not being able to come to the office. It's just not being able to work. Um, some of the other effects, as I mentioned, were restructurings. It, you know, we obviously our clients um, because of supply chain delays and it, you know just delays in being able to make decisions. You know, cause them not to be able to necessarily um, meet their their milestones or deadlines on time. And and one thing you would see in ter in terms of a contrast with like the financial crisis um, is that everybody I think was aligned in working together. And there wasn't this. It was a humanitarian crisis. So people were saying yes, let's try to restructure. We totally understand. Um, so. You know, the, the one of the big takeaways that I think the pandemic highlighted was, you know, the continued need for investment in Latin America. It's just, it's just, it's one of the most, you know, vulnerable regions in, in, the, in the world. And so 
infrastructure in, in um, Latin America or investment in infrastructure is absolutely needed. Um, they need to have emergency pre procedures in place, you know, companies or uh, entities that are uh, building projects. Um, some of the things that were, you know, we observed as, you know, projects were happening was that quarantines measures in third world countries, you know, the ones that were implemented might not have been the correct ones um, just because just practically a lot of people weren't able to access, um, you know, basic resources for themselves. Um, but one positive thing is that I think we didn't realize at the time in terms of investing and doing deals was remote, remote working did accelerate things. For example, we, you know, closed an FSRU deal with IDB Invest in El Salvador in the middle of the pandemic. And that continued, it, you know, maybe could have been completed a month sooner, but I think, generally speaking, because remote working allowed us all to stay connected, that helped. Um, in the capital market space, we had a deal that closed in a, in a virtual roadshow and had many participants, and it's something that they had never experienced before. And I think, obviously, this has been, you know, another sort of stamp in the approval of the fact that remote working does work and, and actually does help. And, you know, we can still do deals, even though it's better to be in the country with with, um, with you, for example, but uh, it's not gonna slow us down. So I think generally speaking, the pandemic obviously has had horrific uh, impact on, you know, people, but I think um, it doesn't mean that the projects, um, you know, were canceled. I think that people found ways to keep going. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Whenever I have such a high level panel, I'm always tempted to ask the participants for some consulting advice. I have one last question to Carla and maybe if the secretary could also share his thoughts. I'd like to hear from you very, very briefly your opinion on the role of institutions such as the IDB multilateral institutions, and where do you think we should move to support this resource mobilization effort, public-private resource mobilization effort for infrastructure? Carla first, please, and then if the secretary would like to say a few words. Well, thank you for the question. There are two obvious ways forward to, on the one hand, help mobilize private capital, and to meet any market failures that couldn't be solved otherwise. So the first one, leveraging capital, includes less obvious projects, helping exchange projects in the line of market failures, helping to model projects. As we've heard so many times, we need good projects and the best thing, and I benefited from that, is to bring experience from other places. We don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel. So if you can bring in that experience, that's very helpful. And also to try and include those who do not have access to capital. We've been talking about supply chain in Brazil, investing in infrastructure. To do that, you need to strengthen the supply chain. And supply chain often has difficulty accessing banks, accessing banks such as the BNDS, so we can help the supply chain to have access to grow so as to improve the quality of the infrastructure. Fantastic, Carla. Thank you. Secretary, if you could give me some free consulting advice, I'd be grateful. Well, based on our experience hiring the IFC, as you said, bringing in international experience, we just heard that it's key. That's crucial because you are learning from existing best practices and you can add technical capacity building when modeling a project and working with multilateral institutions. That's very important in terms of resources and long-term funding, there's no question that multilateral institutions can look at long-term funding in a more relaxed fashion 
because it's not as worried with market fluctuations in the short term. So that's important because it provides a degree of stability to funding sources. Very important. The exchange, foreign exchange point is interesting. We heard about the previous model. That mitigates the problem a, a little bit, but that's a structural problem. And fortunately, now, well, fortunately on the one hand, but it's a problem on the other hand, due to reasons that are not very positive, considering the high prices of commodities, Investors are less concerned with hedging, and you can feel that in practice. So we can make use of this international liquidity despite the risk, because risk pricing and hedging are cheaper now. Then you, you can devalue commodities because the real is undervalued due to local uncertainty. And of course, we have negative aspects, but we also have positive aspects. And the perspective is that you will need investors less, and but they will be facing risks. Now, in terms of multilateral discussions and their importance, I think that that's uh, very positive. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I actually thank you all. I would like to thank our panelists for sharing their knowledge with us, their knowledge and experience. I would also like to thank those who have stayed with us. So we are running a bit late. And finally, I'd like to tell you, Secretary, that it's a pleasure to participate uh, in activities along with the government of the state of Sao Paulo. And of course, there's always a lot of professionalism involved. Thank you very much, and good evening to you all.